If you're working with computers, you're working with integers. They're in our memory addresses, our network addresses, our encoding, our encryption keys. They're everywhere. So it'd probably be a good idea to learn a little bit about them. We are going to assume that we have two integers, n and m. All right. And these integers, if we have defined them, if both of them are defined, we have values for both n and m, then we can say that there is an expression n is equal to q times m plus r. And furthermore, if we define r as being equal to or greater than 0 but less than m, there is exactly one Q and one R that satisfies that expression. All right, and, and the rest of this lesson is really based on this one equation. So let's do some examples just to give you an idea or a feel for exactly what we're looking at. So if I've got N is equal to 16 and M is equal to three, then I have 16 is equal to Q times three plus R. Remember, the key to there being unique values for Q and R relies on the fact that R is going to be less than uh, M, but greater than or equal to zero. All right, and so Q, let's see. Uh, if Q is equal to one, then we have three. Uh, that leaves 13 left over for R. That doesn't satisfy this expression. Bring Q up. What's the closest value we can get What's the highest value of Q we can get that will get as close to 16 but still below it within this range? Well, it turns out that if I have Q is equal to 5, then I have 15. What plus 15 equals 16? R is equal to 1. Let's try another one. How about N is equal to 3 and M is equal to 10? Now, I didn't say anything about the relative values of N and M. I think M could be greater, N could be greater. Let's see if the expression still holds. What I've got is three is equal to Q times 10 plus R. Now, any value of Q that is above zero is going to give us a value that forces R to be negative and R cannot be negative. So if Q is equal to zero, then what we've got is 0 plus r is equal to 3. This gives us q is equal to 0, r is equal to 3. Now, one other thing I didn't say was I didn't state whether n and m have to be positive. What we're looking at here is typically, what, for, this, for, for this discussion, we are going to assume m is greater than 0. But I didn't say anything about n. So maybe we can do n is equal to negative 11 and m is equal to 5. Well, what is this going to give us? This is going to give us negative 11 is equal to q times 5 plus r. Now, if q is 0, then what I've got is r is negative 11. That, get, that violates this range right here. So what I'm going to have to do is start making negative values of q in order to make it so that, that this, this result of q times 5, is below negative 11, just enough so that r can be in that range. So what we've got is negative 1, that'll be negative 5. Still, r has to be negative, uh, negative uh, 6 in order to get to negative 11. So how about q is equal to negative 2? That's negative 10. Still, r has got to be negative 1. That violates that range. q equals negative 3. So if I've got q is equal to negative 3, then this becomes negative 15. Negative 15 is below negative 11 such that r can still be in this range. So negative 15, uh, and then to get up to negative 11, we have to have an r of 4. So we've got negative 15 plus 4 is equal to negative 11. Now, let me show you a little bit about what this, what this expression looks like whenever we graph it out. Let's assume that I'm going to make a graph that represents what values of R satisfy the, that expression. And remember our expression is N is equal to Q times M plus R. 
based on different values of n. Just for the purpose of this graph, let's just assume that both n is greater than zero and or equal to zero, actually, greater than or equal to zero. M for this discussion is greater than zero. And remember, R needs to be in that range. R needs to be greater than or equal to zero and less than M. All right, so let's see what happens. If I have an M, excuse me, an N equal to zero. So we're starting right down here. At this point right here, we've got N is equal to zero. If n is equal to zero, well, really, for r being greater than or equal to zero, and, and excuse me, r is, is less than m, we can't have a q of anything other than zero. For example, let's assume that r is equal to m. Then I can have a q of negative one, which will make it so that n equals zero. In other words, let's just pick some numbers. So if q is, e, excuse me, if m is equal to five, and r is equal to 5, then q needs to be negative 1 for n equal to 0. But that, once again, violates this range right here. So the only way that we can get an, a value of n is equal to 0 is if both q and r are both 0. So I'm just going to say we've got 0 there. Now, what happens as we move up? Well, this scale is a continuous scale. What we're talking about here are, are integer values. So we'll go up to one. Let's just assume that Q is not, or yeah, that, that M is not equal to one or something small. Let's just assume that M has some magnitude to it, like a five or an eight or a 10 or something like that which would mean that when we increment n to one, then what's gonna happen is r is gonna go up to one. And if we increment n up to two, then r is gonna go up to two. And what you get is this stepping. Every time you increment, you're gonna go up a little bit, all right? And that is going to keep happening until we get to a point where n is equal to m. Now, if n is equal to m, then q becomes 1, and r goes back to 0. So at some point, we're going to drop right back down so that r is equal to 0. Now, this happens just shy of r equal to m. r will never equal m. Based on, this, based on this range right here, it's going to keep going up and up and up until it's just shy of n, m and then it's going to drop down to zero and what you're going to get is this over and over and over we call this a sawtooth wave and so at this point we've got n equals m at this point we've got n is equal to 2m at this point right here we have n is equal to 3m and so forth all integer values for q and so at this point we have q is equal to 1 at this point we have q is equal to 2 at this point we have q is equal to 3 to give you an idea of how q and r change as we go through this expression or as, as n increments. Now, yes, I did, it does sort of look like I picked a specific value for m here. Uh, the value for m here is basically, we got one, two, three, four. m would be five for my drawing here, but this was meant to be more kind of theoretical to show you how r increases up to just shy of m and then drops down to zero whenever we cycle through. Now, there are a couple of other things that we can get, garner from this, this drawing. First of all, when r equals zero, what does r equals zero mean? Well, you notice at these points where r equals zero that the value of n is equal to a multiple of m. In other words, m divides nicely into n without a, without a remainder. Well, when r is equal to zero, what we say is, is that n is a multiple of m. Another way of saying this is that m divides n. And we actually have a way of writing that mathematically, an expression. And that expression looks like m divides n. 
And so that's just their, our representation saying that m goes into n without a remainder, right? Well, it turns out that all of these other periods where m does not divide m, we have a, a representation for that too. So m does not divide m. Well, the representation for that is m, and it looks like the divide symbol, but there's a little slash through it, does not divide n. Now in our expression, n equals q times m plus r, you may be wondering where our q and our r came from, or at least why we named them what we did. Well, q is the quotient and r is the remainder. And it comes directly from that long division, right? And so you start out with some number that you're dividing into another one and you keep those successive subtractions until you come up with a result, a remainder that is too small to pull any more of our divisor out of. And therefore you get this idea that R is going to be greater than or equal to zero, but less than M. And then the quotient is, of course, what is going to be the result of that long division. Well, we have another way of describing this remainder. It's the remainder function, otherwise known as the modulo. And whenever you do this in pa on paper in mathematics, you would say something along the lines of n mod m. In other words, I am going to be taking m out of n until I get a remainder. Now, in a lot of coding languages, there's syntax that allows us to represent this function. Typically, you see something like the percent sign that will give you the remainder. So in all of our computing functions, we do have access to directly find R. Now, in integer division, when we're doing this on the computer, oftentimes the result will be given to you as an integer that is a truncated result of a division by n, of n by q, and, or excuse me, n by n. So if you divide m into n, you're going to get some sort of a quotient with a remainder. But if you do this in integer math on the machine, that remainder goes away. Now we are going to use this same expression to do something called a base b expansion of n. Before we, before we move into this, understand that we're still using the same expression. We're still using the m equals q times, n, or excuse me, n equals the q times m plus r. We're just gonna change our variables around a little bit in order to represent this new concept of base representation. So I've got this n that is equal to, and I'm going to use a slightly different variable. We'll have b times n sub one. And so we're gonna start out with an initial value of n. We're going to get to a kind of a next value to evaluate of n. And so we've got this n zero is equal to b times n one plus a sub zero. Now, right up front, we already knew that a must be, a, excuse me, a sub zero must be greater than or equal to uh, zero, but we're also gonna make it less than b. The other thing that we're gonna do though, is we're gonna assume that, and, and this is just for the purpose of this discussion, that n sub zero is greater than, well, I'll make it greater than or equal to zero. And we're also gonna have b is greater than or equal to two. So since b is greater than or equal to two, we've already made that, that premise, right? Then n sub one is, has to be less than or equal to half of n sub zero. So we're gonna simply, and I'm gonna write this down generically, I'm gonna say, n sub k is less than or equal to one half of n sub k minus one, 
all right? So, so if, if a sub zero ends up being zero, then, and we know that b has to be greater than or equal to two, then we know that n sub k has to be less than half of n sub k minus one, which means after we apply this, if I bring n sub one down here, I know that this n sub one is less than this n sub zero. Well, let's apply the same thing again, and we'll get n sub 1 is equal to b times n sub 2 plus some sort of a remainder, a sub 1. And then we'll do it again. A sub, excuse me, n sub 2 is equal to b times n sub 3 plus some sort of a sub 2. This n sub 2 is at least half of n sub 1. So we keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller until we get to some point and we'll just simply say n sub k is equal to b times 0. So you keep dividing this in half and dividing this in half and it's going to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller until the point it gets to the bottom limit, the lower limit, which is going to be 0 plus a sub k. Now, before I explain the importance of this, let's talk about it with an example. How about I have a integer 5,234. And let's say that for this example, b is equal to 10. Now, if I divide 10 into this, I get 5 to 3 times 10 plus my remainder is 4. All right. So now my n sub 0 is 5,234, my n sub 1 is 523, my a sub 0 is 4. If I do this again, I repeat this again, now I'm dividing 523 by 10, I get 52 times 10 plus 3. Now this is my n sub 2. Now I do 52 is equal to 5 times 10 plus 2, right? So 5 times 10 is 50, plus 2 is 52. The 5 is now my new n, so I've got 5 is equal to, well, in this case, since 5 is less than 10, it is 0 times 10 with a remainder of 5. Now, the important thing to see from this is that what I've done is just simply separated out using these remainders, these decimal values. So I've got 5, 2, 3, 4. I've pulled out one at a time, starting on the right-hand side, I've pulled out as remainders those decimal values or those integers that represent each one of the decimal digits. So the thousands place, the hundreds place, the tens place, the ones place. Turns out that that also works for any one of these bases. So if I talk about this base B expansion, if instead of using 10, I used 5, then it would be base 5 and it would give me all the digits for the base 5. What values are valid for base 5? Well, a sub 0, or actually any sort of a, a sub k, must be less than b. So if we use 5 for our b, then our a's, all of our remainders, would have values of either 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. They can't be 5 because that would violate our range, all right? Let me write down the expression for exactly what a base n expansion looks like. So what we're saying with this base n expansion is that n is equal to, or excuse me, our base b expansion, is that a is equal to some sort of b to the k times a sub k, right? And then b to the k minus 1 times a sub k minus 1 plus b to the k minus 2 times a sub k minus 2 plus all the way down until we get b to the 0 times a sub 0. Now, some things to note here. Why did I have these powers of k? Well, if you looked at the, uh, the manipulation of that um, expression as we went down, every time we pulled out a b, we were increasing powers of b until you got to this last, this last remainder, a sub k. The other thing to note is this b sub 0. Well, anything 
raised to the zero is equal to one, which means that this last piece here, this is the ones place always. Now, going back to our expression, n is equal to q times m plus r, we see that m could equal one or m could equal n when r is equal to zero. That is where we will begin our discussion about prime numbers.